thanks for the organizing for organizing this meeting uh, where we can see each other face to face, which is something that I've really been missing. And also to the KPP because it provided the facilities. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, evolved cataclysmic variables and particular uh, work that I've been working, uh, which is a particular CV and use the CNO ratio in trying to understand the evolution of these peculiar CVs. So the outline of the talk, so I'll start giving a short review of the, what we know, especially the signatures that we find in these uh, evolved CVs. Uh, well, my little contribution to the field and what are the next steps. So let's kick off. So, well, I'll, I'll make use of all the previous sessions. So you will be doctrinated about CVs. So I'm skipping all the definitions. So by now, you know everything about CVs. Oh, carbon deficiency. So here on the right plot, I'm showing an infrared spectrum where here, if you pay attention, 2.3, 2.5 uh, wavelength range, you should see for a normal CV uh, the CNO bands. So here on the top, I put something what we see in normal CVs. But for this particular uh, evolved uh, CV, here is it, sir. It doesn't have, so the authors there computed that this is a carbon deficient system. And if we go to the ultraviolet, uh, where the white dwarf dominates, uh, we see something similar. Again, I'm comparing a normal CV with an evolved one. And here you can see emission of carbon in a normal CV, but in the evolved one, there is depletion of CV. But another feature that you can see here is the emission of nitrogen. So the conclusion that comes out from this is that there must be CNO burning in the past of the CV, such that there was an enhancement of nitrogen and depletion of carbon. So to that, for that to happen, it means that the initial donor must have, have, must have been massive. So some binary population synthesis models um, for a cataclysmic variable, including evolved uh, systems, uh, in this work, there are three uh, major uh, conclusions. One of them, if you pay attention to the bottom panel of this uh, figure, we see that evolved donors dominate below orbital periods of 1.25, and also they dominate for orbital periods larger than five hours. So these guys have been suggested to be progenitor of ultra compact white dwarf binaries uh, like AMCBN stars. And another thing that they saw in, the, in their models is that these systems do not present uh, the period gap. So as they say, they can evolve into an ultra compact object. So now we have some evidence, evidence uh, of a few systems that are being able to evolve a bit below uh, the minimum period. The minimum period is demarcated by this uh, blue dotted line. And also they do show more helium. So these systems are thought to be transiting from the CD population into AMCBN stars. Another feature that can be differentiate these systems is that here, well, uh, above orbital periods of five, as we said, uh, the, most of the system are likely to be evolved. But what happened uh, for those are uh, lower orbital periods. So how we can distinguish? What happened is that uh, CVs do follow the, a very nice, well, very nice, uh, let's say, pooling of the donor, where for a, a given orbital period, it is expected to have cer certain spectral type, and with the spectral types that can translate into an effective temperature of the donor. But a, a, a CV with evolved donors deviate from this relation. So this is for most of CV, but if we see some more updated plot of um, here is the, the track for unevolved CVs. And this, as now you see, there are more systems that do present evolved donors. Um, so another thing is that um, here you can see in the chart diagram, diagram 
were the system. So this is a, was a very interesting one because uh, it is a board, but if you do simulations, binary simulations, then it can tell that this will go to, uh, to, the, uh, to the region where we find extreme low mass white dwarfs. And that motivated to do a, a larger search for other systems. And what happened here is that they are treating and at some point they detach, they look like uh, extremely low mass white dwarf and then they can evolve into the C uh, AMCBM stars. Uh, and finally, so this is CV. Here we have accretion rate as a function of the orbital period. And the accretion rate measure for the CVs are given by this uh, gray dot. And the theory of the standard CV evolutions is represented by this dashed black line. Here you see the period gap, and here we see the minimum period that this system reached. So if we use the same theory, even though knowing all the problems that Diogo presented, uh, and evolve a uh, CV that has a more massive companion, initial companion. This is what we have, the red track. So what we see here is that the period curve is shifted towards shorter orbital period, and the same thing happened happen for the, uh, the orbit, uh, minimum period. And this is very exciting because this evolutionary channel connects two exciting phenomena. One of them is the supernova type of progenitor through the single degenerate channel. Uh, if the white dwarf is accreting large accretion rate, a lot of hydrogen can be burned quasi steadily on the white dwarf surface. <laughs> While in the other end, we have the AMCBN, and these systems are very interesting because they, uh, uh, they can be used as calibrator for the LISA interferometer mission. Uh, so then here, the red point shows um, the CVs with the bold donors, and as you see, there is a, a horrible disagreement here. So here's another evidence that there are missing things in the CV evolution and the prescription needs revision. So, okay, this has been a review and, and this system here is the one I'll be talking now. Uh, because what I've been doing, so basically like a short outline would be that I measure some parameter for this specific uh, evolved CV, uh, make some uh, binary simulations and see where my points fall in this uh, MISA, uh, in, this, uh, in this grid. So I introduce to you the guy. Uh, this is uh, the CV and this is uh, HST spectra. So here again, you can see that the carbon emission is depleted, but we do have enhancement of nitrogen. So I fit this spectrum using white dwarf synthetic models and pooling white dwarf models. And I use two assumptions. First, I assume it has a lot of reddening to see the implications. And the other one, I leave it free, but I give you an advance. The preferred choice is to have a very, very low reddening. So these are the parameters uh, I fit. Uh, so pay attention that here I'm trying to fit also the hydrogen to helium abundance, and that is given by the blue end of the spectrum because this, this is the bit that is more sensitive to the fit. And the metals that I am able to see in the spectrum plus the CNO products because we think that this system underwent the CNO burning in the past. Um, so this is the fit to the to the line. So you see the spectrum isn't very great. So we do have a very good uh, fit for those that it, for example, silicon, uh, which has more transitions. So we do have a more accurate measurement. Uh, for carbon, for example, here is the line, uh, but here we have uh, interstellar absorption that is affecting the, the absorption line. And nitrogen, if we think what is the prediction for hydrogen for this system? Here are the it is spectrum where the strongest uh, nitrogen line should be observed. But uh, <laughs> if you look at the spectra, it's well within the, uh, uh, the uncertainty, I mean, the, the noise of the spectra. So it's quite challenging. But uh, for nitrogen, I can say that I can get an upper limit for it. And carbon, I can get some from this line. So it's not great, but I still try to do something with these measurements. 
and this well, these are the results of the fit. These are the values that I get from these two abundances. And why these two abundances? Because using the carbon to nitrogen ratio, I can constrain the evolution of these systems. So here I'm showing the sample. So here I have carbon to nitrogen. This is the helium to hydrogen abundance and also the accretion rate because knowing the surface gravity and means that you can know the mass of the white dwarf and knowing the mass of the white dwarf, you can use the compressional heating to determine the accretion rate. But see, here you see two different samples and that is because of the reddening. The reddening has a great, uh, a huge uh, effect on the mass in the white dwarf. So using these parameters that I measure, well, this one I'm excluding because as I said, the spectra doesn't provide a very reliable estimate because we don't have helium lines as sometimes we see in the optical spectra of white dwarf, single white dwarfs. And then I also use some parameters that are known from the literature as the, uh, well, we know the spectral type, so from that I can infer the effective temperature, the mass of the donor and the orbital period. So then I did some simulations. So um, I also make sure that uh, the mass structure is very large so we can uh, ensure that the system got alternative chemical mass transfer. So for that, I have this range of the mass of the donor, the initial mass of the donor. I choose this range of the orbital period. And when I see that there is some uh, water solution, I think it's gonna fit. Then I increase the, the time resolution and I try two white dwarf masses. So here are examples of these uh, simulations. So on, from top to bottom, you see the accretion rate, the mass ratio, the effective temperature, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, and the hydrogen to helium. And this horizontal line represents the measurement. So basically then what I want to do is to see which of all these track uh, hits uh, the measurements of the of this system at the at this orbital period. So for that, I fitted a Gaussian pro uh, see, I hit, I fit a Gaussian process, and that's very nice because it can give you a, a fit curve parameters. And I was hoping that all these parameters or like all these fits would overlap at some region and that being the best solution. But I'm gonna go back, and as you see here, my find some uh, uh, tracks that. Uh, reproduce the accretion rate, but then if we go, we go down, for, ex for example, here the carbon to nitrogen, there is no track that hits the, the solution. So it didn't happen for 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.83 solar masses of the white dwarf, but it did happen for 0 0.6. And another, another thing that I did is to combine these solutions and trying to find the minimum. And that minimum is here and there. And as you see, well, they sort of fall in the same area when we look at the mass of the donor. But the orbital period, if we have a lower mass, it needs a bit of larger initial orbital period to find the solution. Uh, so this is the solution, those uh, points I, I showed in the previous uh, slide. And the same thing I already said to you. So I might find something that hit one of the points, but then I couldn't find a solution that hit the mass of the donor. Uh, so, but also all this with the caveat that I'm applying CD evolution and the theory that we have for CD evolution, which might not be right. Um, finally, the conclusions of this work is that the donor mass is not that big and being not that big means that this system never get to this high accretion rate uh, to experience the super soft X-ray source phase and neither needed a thermal time scale mass transfer to evolve as it looks now. It, it looks like now. Okay, and future work. Okay, it was just one point, but we would really like to have a more uh, broader study uh, to study it uh, systematically. So for that, I'm going to introduce FORMOS. FORMOS is a four meter telescope that is in development. It's gonna have a high and low resolution spectroscopy. We have 18 surveys. Okay, great. <laughs> 18 surveys and one of these surveys are we are gonna observe of type of binaries. Um, so here's the footprint that FORMOS is gonna have. So it will have targets from all the uh, southern hemisphere. 
And here I'm showing the, the resolution of the spectrograph. So high resolution, it has a spectral resolution of uh, 20,000 and a living thing magnitude between 16 and, uh, 15 and 16 and 800 fibers. The low resolution spectrograph is around 6,000 and we have more fibers here and it have a, um, a, 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 the, uh, two fainter targets. And so what we did is like to cross match uh, earlier there are three Gaia with Gales because the Gales give you an idea that the binary might have a white dwarf, hopefully. Um, so in this plot here, you have uh, the FUB Gales magnitude. And here you have the polar magnitude of FUB Gales and Gaia. And this block here is the main sequence. Down here, you should, well, not very clear, but here you have the white dwarf and somewhere here you have sub dwarfs. So we did a cut here and everything that is below this line we are trying to observe, uh, excluding white dwarfs and sub dwarfs, of course. And that cross match gives us the, uh, this distribution where here we don't have targets because uh, the value through footprint and that is in total 250,000 targets that we're gonna observe. Okay, so this is part of what I am interested in evolved CDs, but hopefully we can have like a more global, a more broad understanding of all evolution of compact, I mean, close uh, binaries, uh, especially in this area, which I'm, I'm interested by hoping with having a more large, okay, I'm about to finish. Uh, hopefully having more larger and uh, samples, we are able to answer all the questions that have been present in the previous session. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions, comments, suggestions. <laughs> questions? It's late. <laughs> Questions, yeah, it's getting late. I have, I have one question. If you go to the, in your review part, if you go to the, uh, the disagreement between the accretion rates predicted and this one? observed. This one? No, when you showed, like for evolved donors, you had where? This one? No, no, no. no. This one here? This one, yeah, uh, no. You had one where you showed that the accretion rates are much lower than predicted from the evolution. Oh, yes, this, this one. This yeah, one. this one, exactly, with the red points. Mm -hmm. So that is probably because you use very strong magnetic braking. Yes, I had the standard prescription in MESA, which is use gamma, the exponent of gamma, two, three. Yeah, well, this is worrying. Okay. Yeah, um, so this is, I guess it's more of a, just a general comment. I find this really interesting. Um, some years ago, so I have a paper on rates and delay times of type 1a supernovae from 2009, and as part of that work, I wasn't looking for these systems, but this AMCVN channel where you have, you know, a very low mass uh, donor, right, the CV channel. I just recall um, from my simulations back then, and this goes along with the, with the alpha di discussion we've been having today, um, I found that I can more readily make these with a lower alpha value. So around, I think I was using 0.5, something like that, and lambda 1. So of course the constant lambda value is probably all wrong and all that, but in general, but the sort of so-called standard model that's used in population synthesis with the alpha of one, I wasn't finding. I was making these, uh, these that this AMCVN channel from the CV sort of. No, no, no. So, so yeah, but I, I was finding them with the uh, lower alpha. Just, just a comment. Okay. Probably should be redone though. <laughs> well, to be fair, in this is just like 10% what they find the parameters they use in the binary population system. So it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, so it's not much either. So that's why it was difficult to find them. Thanks. I was just wondering for the CNO ratios and also the helium to hydrogen ratios, does the model predict that it'll get more 
nitrogen enriched and carbon depleted and helium enriched as it goes through shorter periods? Or is it low just because it never, because it wasn't high enough mass to begin with? Uh, so here? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, like I think what is happening is like because it's losing a lot of mass, but here is not much mass left, so it's exposing a lot of the of the interior of the of the star. So the convection it, it might be happening some red, red stuff. Yeah, I think I mean I, I think if I'm reading right, the model at least predicts that if you come back when it's at three hours, it'll be more nitrogen enriched and carbon depleted and helium yeah. enriched, right? So sorry, I, it was a, it was a question or comment? I, I I think I, I yeah I was just asking to see this plot. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. We have time for another question. If there is one, if not, thanks for that. Okay.